I'm Sheila Walker, and I'm so pleased to be part of the Academic Council of the Pan-African Heritage World Museum. And I'm thrilled to be part of this inaugural conference, albeit virtually. I'll share with you some clips from my documentaries, Scattered Africa, Faces and Voices of the African Diaspora, and Familiar Faces, Unexpected Places, a Global African Diaspora, to give you a sense of how I see this African diaspora. to get to know Africa when I was an adolescent. I was the only colored girl in my class at an elite white college. And that wasn't a bad experience. It was culturally enriching. It's always culturally enriching to get to know other people, but I needed some balance. And I found that balance by going to Cameroon with an exchange program, by living with a wonderful family of just natural pan-African orientation in the Bamoon kingdom. And it was wonderful to live in a place that defied the current stereotypes of Africa as being primitive, Tarzan. And so this, my first experience in Africa conflicted radically with the kinds of stereotypes that we were being assaulted with in the United States and surely in the rest of the world. And so um, this trip to Africa oriented the rest of my life. And the family I lived with, what they said first surprised me. They said, welcome home. And I thought, welcome home? But I'm from New Jersey. How is this home? I'm thousands of miles away from home. But these Africans were so much more knowledgeable about the world and about the Pan-African world than I was. I, as an African-American in the United States, I was told formally in my elite education that we US African Americans had no culture and certainly no African culture. But staying with this great family, the Enjoya family in Fumban in Cameroon, I learned that I did indeed have a cultural heritage, an African cultural heritage, because I just recognized stuff. For example, um, eating, you know, we have to do that. And initially I dreaded some of the things that I had to eat. Fufu, that big ball of cornmeal with those greens, with that meat in it. And then I began to think, wait a minute, wait, 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 this is kind of familiar. <laughs> you know? Don't we eat grits? African-Americans, don't we eat grits? And don't we eat greens with meat in them? Uh, so I began to see the, those similarities. So the fact that I began to understand the culinary similarities, I could dance like them, like the same music, um, they, I think, began to see me as more like them, as I was seeing them as more like me. But it was this, this uh, African experience that allowed me to understand the Africanity of my culture. I became an anthropologist, and I did my initial research in Bahia, in Brazil, because I knew that if we were said to have no culture, there was no, no African culture, there was no way that could be said about them what was commonly known was that Yoruba culture especially was alive and well in Bahia and was a flagrant part of the larger culture. But in that huge country, Brazil, Brazil is the major country of the African diaspora. I learned that Bahia was not the only place with African culture. Um, African culture exists throughout Brazil in various ways. Most Brazil is the second African country in the world after Nigeria. 
and um, so much of African culture is, is there. And so you can find specific African cultures like the Yoruba culture of Bayit, predominantly Yoruba culture of Bayit, not exclusively because Africans met other Africans every place. The place in which I've experienced most these meetings of Africans with other Africans in the Americas was in the state of Minas Gerais in the interior of Brazil in which I went to what was called a Mozambique kingdom where I met a Congo queen. In their chapel, there were several black saints. There was St. Benedict of the Moor, patron saint of Palermo and, and Sicily in Italy. There was also St. Ephigenia. St. Ephigenia was from the Ethiopian Coptic church. There was also Nossa Senhora do Aparecida, patron saint of Brazil is a black woman. So this, this Mozambique kingdom with the Congo Queen was a great example of Africans meeting Africans in the Americas. It's very important for us to reinterpret, to re-understand the role of Africans in the creation of the Atlantic world. If we learned anything about the enslaving of African people, over centuries by Europeans. What we probably learned was that Africans were brought to the Americas to do unskilled labor. Well, that makes no sense. And it's also not true. It does not correspond to the facts. If you look at the way Europe named Africa, you notice that parts of the African coast particularly were named for commodities, the Gold Coast, the Rice Coast. Well, those two commodities are very important in telling the st an accurate story of the Americas and in reinterpreting what this commerce in African lives trivialized by the terminology slave trade uh, meant. And it, will, it should be noticed that I will not call anyone a slave. And they say Zaire, father of negritude, or one of the fathers of negritude, talked about the chosification, the thingification of people. I am not about to thingify my ancestors by referring to them as slaves. Slaves suggests willlessness, whereas it is clear that the 12 to 15 million people who survived the horrible trip to the Americas in the most inhumane of situations in boats specifically engineered by Europeans to transport people as cargo, those Africans, in spite of having arrived in horrible situations, created new cultures. They created new linguistic systems, new spiritual systems, certainly culinary systems. And think of the joy of the Americas the celebrations, most of these celebrations seem to have an African aura about them. Celebrations seen as secular as well as celebrations seen as spiritual, as if there were some line between the spiritual and the secular. So we need to rethink this commerce in African lives as a transfer of technology from Africa to the Americas. So Europeans knew which Africans knew which technologies they needed to develop the Americas. They were looking for gold, rich, uh, the, the riches of the Americas. Gold, okay, so they brought experts from the Gold Coast, Ghana, to mine gold in Brazil and Colombia and Ecuador, places where there's still gold. And they called them Negros Minas. The Portuguese and Spanish called these Africans Negros Minas, mining Negros, because of their technological expertise. And currently, there are still places where people of African origin are mining gold, like in a place I went to in Ecuador on the Pacific coast of South America, called Playa de Oro, Gold Beach, and making beautiful jewelry from this gold. In Minas Gerais, in Oro Preto, there's a mine in which the Afro-Brazilians who now use this mine as a teaching device talk about the, the uh, role of Africans in enriching Portugal, for example, and the role of Africans, uh, the role of African knowledge. 
the Portuguese enslaved Africans from what was called the Gold Coast to mine gold in Brazil. They said these Africans, whom they called mining Negroes, had an almost magical luck in finding gold. Luck or expertise? Toda a tecnologia empregada aqui na extração do ouro, ela é devido a esse conhecimento africano. Eles precisaram dessa mão de obra especializada. Então eles vão numa região específica da África, que é a região que a gente chama de Costa da Mina, né? E já tinha grandes reinos no passado que faziam uso desse ouro, né? Aí a gente fala do, do reino Ashanti, né? Do grande reino do Mali também. Não fosse a presença africana, não fosse o saber e o conhecimento trazido pelos africanos, que embora não tenham chegado aqui como mão de obra escravizada, Portugal jamais teria conseguido tirar daqui o volume de ouro que tirou. In Ecuador, descendants of mining Negroes still pan gold and transform it into beautiful creations like those of their African ancestors. Rice was the first food crop traded in the Americas. The rice that came to the Americas, we tend to think it was Asian, wrong. It was from West Africa. This is rice domesticated in West Africa on what, what the Europeans called the Rice Coast, the area from Liberia to Senegal. Owners of plantations in Louisiana, in the low country of South Carolina and Georgia, as captains of slave ships, to bring them skilled rice Negroes. One result of my research in the global African diaspora was that I organized a conference on the African diaspora and the modern world, to which I invited more than 60 people from 20, more than 20 countries. And I learned, I was shocked by what I learned at my own conference that I thought I should have learned earlier. I have a doctorate in anthropology. Why was I so ignorant? What I learned was of the importance of Africans and African descendants in the creation of the modern world, of the Americas, of the Atlantic world. I should have known that before. The African peoples constituted the majority of the people who came from the old world to the new world. Um, according to uh, several sources, between 1492 and 1776, or roughly the first 300 years of what we understand to be the uh, colonial period of American history, 1492, the Columbus voyages, the 1776, uh, 6.5 million people crossed the Atlantic from Africa and Europe and settled in the Americas, North, Central, South America, and the Caribbean. Of those 6.5 million people, only 1 million were European. The other 5.5 million were African. Most of the histories that we have, have have been written from a colonial perspective, from the perspective of the minority of the population, from the perspective of the institutional histories of those, without taking into account any of the uh, economic, political, and social consequences of this simple demographic fact. This was the largest dispersal of people throughout the world up to that time in the whole, whole human history. And so without Without understanding the, the Africans in, in the Atlantic world, you cannot have a, a clear understanding of what the modern world is. As a result of that co conference, in which I learned so much, I thought that there should be continuity. That continuity takes the form of an edited book called African Roots, American Cultures, Africa and the Creation of the Americas, and a documentary film, Scattered Africa, Faces and Voices of the African Diaspora, that features people who were present at the conference, both noted scholars, as well as people whose existence is denied, like Afro-Argentinians, Afro-Uruguayans. As a follow-up to the conference on the African diaspora and the modern world, I later organized a group of Spanish-speaking Afro-South Americans to kind of complete this uh, effort at talking about the Americas. An Afro-Venezuelan colleague and I were able to bring together people from Spanish-speaking Afro-South America to create a book called Conocimiento desde adentro, los Afro-Suramericanos hablan de sus pueblos y sus historias. It's not in English yet, but it would be 
knowledge from the inside, Afro-South Americans talk about their communities and their histories in which people from the Americas, when I say Americas, I mean from Chile to Canada, who talk about their own societies from the inside. And that product, that book, the experiences in the rest of the Americas and in the global African diaspora allowed me to create a documentary that I called Familiar Faces, Unexpected Places, a Global African Diaspora that I showed at the United Nations as their 2018 Black History Month program in the context of the United Nations International Decade for People of African Descent, and that I was pleased that the United Nations sent around the world to the UN Information Centers for viewing. In that documentary, I just had to show the global nature of the African diaspora. It's not just us in the Americas, it's all of us around the world. And if we have that perspective, it allows us to have a, a greater sense of what Africa is.